June 1944. The Second World War had reached a critical moment. The only way to stop Hitler in his tracks and to reclaim lost territory was to launch the largest seaborne invasion in history, the moment that became known as D-Day. You are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. The D-Day invasion was spearheaded by paratroopers. Leaping into the unknown, their job was to prevent enemy reinforcements. Without their actions, Allied victory in the West would not have been possible. I have to tell you, everybody says we're heroes, and that isn't true. We volunteered to do this, we trained to do it, and we were paid to do it. That does not make you a hero. There could have been no spearhead and no paratroopers without the workhorses of the sky, the Douglas C-47s, the airplanes that flew in their hundreds across the English Channel to Normandy. Charged with delivering the airborne divisions to their rendezvous with destiny, one airplane had to lead the way. It seemed totally beyond comprehension that the airplane that led the D-Day invasion, this incredibly important artifact, would be in a scrapyard. There's just no way that that can be true. I just had a feeling there's something special about this airplane. And he said, well, that airplane was the lead plane into Normandy. This is the story of the men who found and who were determined to restore this iconic aircraft, of the plane's part in one defining moment in history, and of a dream that she should fly again back to the coast of France to commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. That's All Brother, the plane that led the D-Day invasion. So far, in the dramatic story of That's All Brother, we've learned how the lead plane on D-Day was lost, abandoned in a boneyard, how she was rediscovered by military historians, and her identity confirmed by the commemorative Air Force, how the CAF were determined to restore her so her part in dropping the very first paratroopers on D-Day could be fully recognized and honored, how the plane's restoration at Basla turbo conversions was undertaken, repairing decades of neglect and corrosion, and how, crucially, after a faltering start, the engines were coaxed warily into life. Now thoughts turn urgently to her star turn and most important mission to date, her return to Normandy for the anniversary of D-Day itself. But will she fly? In the brief interim, That's All Brother has been fitted with vital new engine cowlings and her landing gear has been satisfactorily and thoroughly tested. With the new cowlings in place, it has been possible to run the engines at full power. The signs are good, but still her team anxiously await the plane's most demanding test, her first flight. Well, it's uh, really exciting to be here. Uh, you know, for me personally to close the loop the last time you know, this airplane flew, I got to fly it in here and, and to be honored to be the guy selected to fly it today is uh, humbling and exciting. Um, you know, this airplane represents a uh, big step in the commemorative Air Force. Uh, you know, when I started flying Warbirds, uh, CAF and other Warbirds, you know, over 30 years ago, the difference between a Warbird and a freighter was a paint job. And this airplane represents how far we've come both as uh, the commemorative Air Force and as a Warbird industry, that we now have uh, these examples of flying Warbirds that are truly exquisite. I mean, this airplane is a Smithsonian quality restoration, and, uh, and we're going to be able to take it out and fly it. So uh, that's really a, uh, a big step for the CAF, and I'm really excited to uh, be part of an organization that is committed to preserving assets like this, but not just sticking them away in mothballs somewhere, but uh, taking them out on the road so people can see them and uh, taking them to Normandy so the airplane that led the raid can fly over Normandy again. And, uh, you know, that's a big deal. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch 
on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. Um, you know, the big gotchas on any first flight in an airplane are the propellers going to govern correctly. Anytime you're flying a brand new engine, there is a chance of an initial failure. Uh, and so uh, we got two new engines. You'd always choose to overhaul engines one at a time. Now we got two brand new engines, which is not what you'd want in a perfect world. But uh, uh, initial failures on new engines are always a, a threat. But uh, typically, they're not catastrophic failures. They're uh, chronic failures. And so uh, the first 20 hours on a new engine, you're always paying very close attention. And so uh, no need or con cause for any undue concern. First of all, it's an incredibly simple airplane. And, uh, and by virtue of the restoration that it's been through, it's simpler because most C-47s have been around for 75 years and all these things have been modified. This airplane's been totally demodified back to its very basic, simple bones. And we have what this airplane was really intended to be, which is a simple airplane that was easy to fly for 19-year-old kids who, with 200 hours total time, who were immersed in this thing we called World War II. And so, uh, from an aviation perspective, yeah, it's a big deal, but it's really not a big deal. I'm quite certain we'll have a short list of things that need to be looked at when we get back, but, uh, as with every flight in an old airplane, you're prepared for the worst and expect the best, and uh, that's what I expect today. All right, welcome everyone to the first flight. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, we're going to start off the safety briefing with the pilots. Um, so Doug, Tom, are you guys ready to go? All right, aircraft from maintenance, aircraft, aircraft is ready to go. As far as the weather goes, we've uh, kind of checked multiple sources. The weather is about as good as we're going to get in January in Wisconsin. Uh, so the snow that's out there right now is going to let off in the afternoon, so we should be able to get a good flight in this afternoon with adequate ceilings. The winds are 14 gusting to 20, but they're coming down the runway. Uh, based on the direction, we plan on using the west runway, uh, and we'll go with that. So uh, on the first flight, our objective is just put some time on the airplane. We're not going to be expanding the envelope or anything. Just make sure nothing's coming out of the airplane, smoke, uh, oil, anything like that. We'll fly around for uh, 15, 20 minutes, and uh, uh, then we'll land, take a look at the airplane, and, uh, and make sure everything's clean and dry, and we'll have press availability at that point, and uh, give some interviews, and then our plan will be to go fly again for the second flight. Any questions? Yes, they are as prepared as they can be, and yes, every conceivable precaution has been taken. Nonetheless, there's no disguising the tension felt by everyone as the moment of takeoff arrives. It is a piece of American history, very important, and uh, it has to be treated as such with respect and a lot of care. We look at the temperatures, pressures, uh, leaks, anything like that, is it making power? And just an overall shake down the airplane. We expect to fly 30 minutes the first time, 
just to be sure that everything's working correctly. We'd like to get three flights on it today, but uh, daylight may be an issue later. This was the airplane, the very airplane that led the raid. And I'm so proud of our organization, the Commemorative Air Force, that we've been able to uh, bring it to this place. There's a lot of work to do, a lot of money that's got to be raised, um, a lot of volunteer work that's got to be done. You know, this is the beginning, not the end. As you can see, she needs a paint job. All the interior fitments need to be done. And uh, the volunteers back at Centex Wing and uh, San Marcos are going to get to work on that just as soon as we get it out of here. And uh, look forward to having, you know, the queen of the C-47 fleet as a member of the CAF. After being in the air for 20 minutes, all happily without incident, that's all brother successfully completes her maiden flight and returns for the necessary and thorough ground checks that follow. Magnificent flight, great airplane. We have a winner here. He only had one job, and that was not to let me screw up, and he did his job. <laughs> Flying a DC-3 is like putting on an old pair of Tony Llamas. It just they fit good, and uh, you know I've been flying this airplane, you know C-47 DC-3s for 32 years, and it's always uh, a great thrill to get back in one, and uh, and this one especially. On behalf of the Commemorative Air Force, I'd like to give a big thank you to all the employees at Basler. Um, you guys have done a great job. It's been a real thrill for me to watch your, your team get behind and get engaged and get excited about this project. This is a big story, and you guys have played a pivotal role in it. And to the folks at the Centex Wing who uh, were instrumental in raising this money and uh, getting behind this project, you know, and this airplane is going to lead you to a new place. And to the thousands of men who uh, bailed out of C-47s and walked on the beach in Normandy on June 6th of 1944, here, here. Here, 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 here. That's all brother began the vital events of D-Day, and D-Day itself was to become the beginning of the end as far as World War II was concerned. It was the day on which troops of the Allied forces landed in Normandy, kick-starting the liberation of important cities and strategic ports and towns throughout northern France. It wasn't by any means the last mission for that old brother, who was to complete many more before the war finally ended, but it was by far her most significant. Her time at Basler now completed, that's all brother is flown well over a thousand miles from Wisconsin to the central Texas wing of the CAF in San Marcos. The crew at Centex eagerly await the arrival of their new star, aware of her historical importance and their role in helping to preserve her heritage. Uh, we're excited to have That's All Brother back here in Texas. Uh, she's flying great. I mean, overall, uh, she flies like a dream. Uh, everyone who's flown a lot of C-47s who's had the opportunity to fly this one will claim that it, it's like it's a brand new airplane. So as with any plane, especially one that's nearly 75 years old, there's always a couple things we got to work out. Uh, we have a little bit of oil we're working on, uh, oil leakage we're working on on the left engine, and we're working with the uh, engine overhauler to address all that. Well, as you can see, if you look up here, there's some of these tubes, and one of these tubes comes from the uh, the blower section of the of the engine. And every time we're shutting the engine down, you can kind of see all these drops down here that 
uh, get scattered about. That that just means that when it was dripping, it was the wind was blowing. But sometimes it'll make a tight puddle. Sometimes it'll uh, leave oil in drops like that. But that's something we re we really want to look at. It's not a tremendous amount of oil or quantity of oil that keeps us from being able to fly safely. Uh, but the big challenge is every time we go somewhere and park on their ramp, uh, we kind of leave a, with maybe an unwelcome present for them. So uh, we'd like to get that addressed to, uh, you know, be a little bit more professional in how we uh, arrive and, and work with the place venues we go to. We're uh, fortunate to have just lined up uh, a paint supplier. Uh, Polyfiber is going to be donating all the paint, and we also have the paint labor uh, lined up as well, which will be done here in Texas, which we're really excited about. And we're also working with the Air Corps folks up in Minnesota, and they are the foremost experts on the, the very detailed lettering and insignia that would be on the plane. Uh, they go through all of the tech orders uh, and manuals from the airplane and come up with exactly every last letter. So they'll be making over 300 masks and placing them on the airplane uh, as part of the paint uh, process so that we have um, an, an extremely authentic C-47 both on the inside and out. I think probably the thing I'm most excited to see uh, happen with the project is going to actually happen in the next few months. Uh, for me, and my perspective as a historian, uh, what we have now is a mechanically sound airplane that's structurally been tested, proven, but we still don't have our complete historic interior in the airplane. We've been quietly sourcing parts over the last 18 months to stock the airplane with its correct vintage radios, with the correct drinking fountain for the paratroopers. Everything down to the smallest detail, including the lavatory, are, are facets of the restoration that remain to be completed and made functional. Uh, much of that work is going to be done by volunteers in the Tulsa area, which is where the airplane was originally accepted for service in the spring of 1944 by the U.S. Army Air Forces. Following the restoration, and what we're calling phase two of the restoration, the historic interior, we'll also have to paint the airplane. The invasion stripes, another characteristic marking that'll be on the airplane, is something else we're looking forward to because we intend to put them back on the way they were applied during World War II. The men of the 87th Troop Carrier Squadron found out on a Sunday that they had to paint all of their airplanes with these invasion stripes before the mission. And having not enough white and black paint on the base, they decided to break into local English hardware stores, take the black and white paint, leaving IOU notes for the shopkeeps, going back to the field and painting the airplanes with mops. Clearly the stripes were there for a purpose, but what was it? And why now? The basis for the story starts at Greenham Common, from where That's All Brother took off on D-Day, and where she and many other aircraft were given their invasion stripes. Approaching June the 5th, an order was issued to paint invasion stripes on the aircraft because the Allies had learned from the parachute drops in Sicily. Many aircraft had been destroyed by friendly fire. Army and Navy gunners were not good at aircraft recognition. And to help them, big, bold, black and white stripes were hastily added to the aircraft as an identification aid so they wouldn't be suffering friendly fire when they flew over the invasion fleet. Now, of course, we recognise from the photographs, these are iconic symbols of the invasion, the black and white stripes. They date that critical moment in history. Unpainted, it wasn't D-Day. Painted, it was D-Day. Overnight, the ships blossomed out in their new war paint. On D-2, invasion markings were applied. Another lesson from Sicily. The aircraft were prepared, the lead plane chosen, but she needed an experienced pilot, one to offer the leadership required for this crucial mission. John Manalin Donaldson, the man selected to pilot That's All Brother, was an inspired and inspiring choice. He was born in 1901 in Alabama. He joined the Alabama Air National Guard and swiftly rose to the rank of base commander a role he performed at several USAAF bases across America. He was subsequently promoted to commander of the 438th Troop Carrier Group 
training in Northern California prior to departing for England. He had shown in training great precision in group formation flying and, critically, the accuracy of dropping paratroops. Less certain is quite why he changed from his original squadron, flying anti-submarine patrols, to flying C-47s instead. Donaldson's a really, really interesting character. He actually um, became a pilot in 1924, so he's a, he's a pioneer in aviation. And that's really the mystery that remains today, is why did he go to C-47s? And I, I just don't know. I have a theory, uh, because early in, the, early in the war, my squadron flew anti-submarine patrols off the coast of Miami in unarmed O-47s. And so I don't know if he just didn't like that and he wanted to be more involved or if they saw, hey, this is a pilot with almost 20 years of flying experience when there's very few pilots out there that have that much flight experience. And here we are, we're needing to boost the, um, you know, the troop carrier levels and stuff. So we need an experienced pilot to be able to not only train these guys, but lead them. And so I don't know if it's that, I don't know what it is, but yeah, he's a fascinating guy. Um, flew tons of uh, uh, different airplanes and after the war came back, uh, reestablished my, my squadron back to state control for the state of Alabama and um, retired as a uh, major general. Well, I had the opportunity to meet his daughter actually um, before she passed away. And um, right after I found the airplane in 2007, we thought that it was Bill of Birmingham because newspapers at the time say Bill of Birmingham uh, General Lewis Brereton, commander of the 9th Air Force, uh, his journal, which I have a copy of, um, it listed as Bell of Birmingham. And yeah, that's because Donaldson and Daniel normally flew Bell of Birmingham. They were both from the same hometown. Uh, we later found out Bell of Birmingham was likely uh, Daniel's plane. We can't confirm that. It may have been Donaldson's, but we don't know. So how come Bell of Birmingham didn't lead the mission? One likely reason lies in the requirement for radar being fitted to the C-47s, which necessitated a hole being cut in the bottom of the fuselage. It may be that Donaldson was wary of Bell of Birmingham undergoing this surgery. So a recently arrived C-47 was selected and subsequently named. Donaldson's daughter is the one that told me, yes, um, he didn't want to cut the holes in Bell of Birmingham and so he got this new one, and he's the one that named the airplane, That's All Brother. Um, and yes, there's a song at the time, a lot of people have said it's named after the song. According to her, it's not. Uh, according to her, it was a message to Hitler, just like the end of a Looney Tunes where Porky Pig says, that's all folks, uh, he, you know, that's all brother. And, because, and that's the other thing that's sort of intriguing to me as someone from Alabama, because that's, you know, sort of a Southern thing of, of you know, if you're leaving somewhere, hey, See you later, brother. Or, uh, hey, brother, how's it going? You know, and something like that. And so it's a it's a term of endearment, but it's, it can also be, as we famously do in the South, politely put you down. And so uh, and so uh, you know to to say that as he would have said it, uh, or anybody from Alabama, like that's all, brother. You're done. You know, in other words, go go away. You know, you're 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 no longer welcome here. And so uh, and so I, I personally I like that as a as a southern as an Alabamian I, I like the sort of southern connection there that, uh, that he kind of puts in a little southern you know slang to to name the airplane so yeah. We had been working uh, with L3 Aerospace Technologies for a number of months. We took the airplane to them uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, on a visit, a meet and greet visit, and uh, left with uh, when are you going to bring it back to get painted, can it be here next Thursday? And so we uh, shuffled the schedule around, got the paint, uh, got the airplane to Waco, and uh, they started work on it. And uh, within about a week they had the aircraft stripped and a week later they had it painted. And um, I flew her home and she looks fantastic. We tried to get as many of the details correct as we could. I mean. Our, our, our source material or grainy, you know, black and white photographs and technical orders, you know, that were written in 1943 and 1944. Um, Air Corps went through all of those and did their best to come up with the color specifications and marking placements uh, for all the detail on the airplanes. And then, of course, you know, the, the big one, which was the detail on the invasion stripes. And uh, the story is those stripes, they weren't masked. They were painted on with mops and brushes. And so our goal was to kind of honor that history. And so at L3, uh, we actually had them paint the stripes on by hand without masks. So the lines aren't perfectly straight. Um, and, you know, nothing is perfect. If you get close and look, um, you'll notice the detail is much like it would have looked again on June 6, 1944. So we got what we were going for. Resplendent in her new paint and sporting her authentic invasion stripes, 
that Saul brother is beginning to look very much the part. However, a few elements are still missing, including one important one, the radar system. Hey, this is Joe Ensminger. I'm with That's All Brother in uh, San Marcos, Texas. And uh, I was get. How are you? <laughs> I was giving your contact information because I was told you may have a, a very specific piece of equipment we're looking for to complete the restoration of That's All Brother. That's right. So we're, we're looking for the radome for the, the SCR 717 radar that was on That's All Brother on D-Day. And they're pretty tough to find, and we heard you might have something that might work. Okay. Well, two, two is definitely better than one. <laughs> what kind of condition are they in? Right. Well, we'll, we'll definitely measure it, but the, the good news is, is that it's not something we're going to fly with, so it would be for static display only. So as long as we can kind of fit it up correctly and make it look right, that'll be great. Well, that's, I, I, I think that's fantastic news. I mean, this is something that we've been searching for. It's in all the photographs. It was on the airplane. Uh, when it flew on D-Day, and, and so I think, I think it'd be a great addition to be able to have something like that, so I feel like we're, we're pretty lucky we were able to hook up with you, and we'll definitely try to get a crew out to visit you to take a look at it and see if we can make it work. <laughs> All right. Well, that's fantastic. We'll, we'll be in touch, and again, we appreciate it. This is exciting news for us. With the CAF team fully occupied in the States, UK-based historian Ian McLachlan volunteered to visit Flixton Museum to get the necessary measurements. Ian, I'm really pleased to meet you. Good to meet you too. I understand that you've spoken to the CAF. Yes, Joe rang me a while ago. Oh, Joe Ensminger. That's right, And yes. you've got something here that yes. they're really excited about. Which I can now show you. Oh, great. Come on, let's have a look. Ah, oh, the things we do for that's all, brother, eh? Show it down. Here she goes. Very gently. Well, it's seen better days, that's for sure. I mean, you could say it's like a whacking great dinosaur egg, but um, it's, it's, it's yeah. fragile, yet when it was built, it had to withstand the, the temperatures uh, at altitudes of 20, 25,000 feet. Mm. It would have to withstand the contractions and the temperatures yeah. there at minus 40 or 50 degrees. But this certainly wouldn't take um, much by way of damage from shrapnel no. and flak and stuff like that. And what's it made of? When we were filming at um, Cambridge recently, we were looking at drop tanks. Mm -hmm. Bowwater and Spicer Cohen made the very early drop tanks. And it was a sort of paper mache composite. Yeah. And I'm looking at this and I'm sort of thinking, well, I'm no plastics expert, but it doesn't look like fiberglass. But no. could it be the same sort of stuff they made the early drop tanks from? I'm wondering that as well, but because where it's actually broken, you can almost see two layers. But like you, I don't think it's fiberglass. Yeah. You can't see anything on the inside that says made by whoever may have made this thing. And normally, you'll find a serial number or an ID plate on it somewhere, but nothing. The radar dome, or radome, was fitted to the underside of an aircraft to protect the radar equipment from the elements experiencing not only very considerable wind resistance, but huge differences in ambient temperature. On D-Day, only the Pathfinder and lead planes were fitted with radar. The others had to follow in order successfully to reach their drop zones. For them, therefore, visibility was a key factor. Well, we had airplanes that were about $100,000 value with a half a million dollars worth of radar in them. Radar altimeter, PPI scope, which the B-17s used on a different deal, but we used it for low-level mapping. Canals, pick up high tension lines, roads, separate trees from grass, unbelievable. Carl Jones is my navigator on Angel Eyes, my C-47. So we always knew where we were. 
or he did, and he would tell me. <laughs> Technology was leaping ahead, leaps and bounds during the Second World War, and the British, having had a fairly disastrous campaign of bombing, trying to find targets, had developed ground imaging radar called H2S. The Americans, with their greater production capacity, took it over and it was called H2X. And it could distinguish fairly clearly major cities and features in major cities, but very good for imaging the difference between land and sea. Now, ASV, air to surface vessel radar, anti-submarine radar of various species, including the SCR-717, fitted to that's all brother, seems to have been an attempt to give you a clearer radar image to support the Eureka ground module and the Rebecca air module already fitted to that's all brother, which would guide the aircraft into a position within a couple of miles of the DZ, the drop zone. But this out in the slipstream on a C-47 would have given you fairly uncomfortable aerodynamics, quite apart from the already well-laden aircraft on its way to the Catentin Peninsula. Donaldson, the pilot, after his flying in That's All Brother, he reverted to the Bell of Birmingham, which did not have this fitted and had, in his opinion, far better flying characteristics without this corrupting the airflow. For this very reason, modern flying regulations would not permit That's All Brother to take to the air with a radome. Nonetheless, the CAF wished to create a replica housing in order to add authenticity when the plane is on display on the ground. For this, accurate measurements are required. I think it's the same as the one we in the, in the museum. Proper. Here we are, what we got here. We've got 110 inches, correct, which translates into whatever that is in... 2.8. 2.8. Significantly, the other element still missing from the freshly painted plane is the all-important nose art. Back at Centex, the attention to detail is exhaustive. The drive to replicate the original art takes both time and skill. The only thing I can think is, if anything, some of the letters up top might need individually twisting, but I think this is looking pretty sweet. I started painting nose art in 2007 when I was given the opportunity to work with the CAF on their B-24 project. Painting nose art on vintage aircraft is extremely rewarding for me because I grew up going to air shows with my dad and my uncle, uh, both in the Air Force. I really became obsessed with the history, you know, full in around 2000, 1999-2000. Just that whole era has become so important to me. And so to see like this plane when it's done on the ramp and the flying and in the magazines, it'll be pretty special to know that I had a piece of you know, all the people working together on this plane to bring it back to what it is today. And it's such a historic plane that's it's really an honor. We made sure the lettering was correct. I drew it all up on the computer based on the historic photos. And we made little tweaks and adjustments, uh, projected it on the plane to get it in the right location based on historic photos. And even from there, up on the scaffold, we were making adjustments to the individual letters to try and get it as close as we could to being the accurate nose art that it wore in 1944. And once we got it drawn onto the plane, uh, I started painting in the yellow, uh, then switched sides, did it all over again. And what's unique about this aircraft is we have photos of both sides, a lot of times you would only get a photo of one side when you're doing your research. So we're really fortunate in that respect. It takes a lot longer than people would think. Uh, you have to do your brush strokes, uh, smooth everything out, and a lot of the times the colors may not take on the first go through, so you have to do a second coat. And then there's the lead time for the drying. Uh, it, it's, it's a time-consuming process. Everybody here has been really nice, really helpful. Uh, wanting to make my job as easy as possible and, and that's really nice. It helps me you know, feel confident and relaxed and be able to put out you know, a quality product that they'll be happy with.
but just the opportunity in general to work on such a historic aircraft is amazing and it, it, it's special. As the details fall into place, thoughts now turn to the practicalities of her anniversary mission back to France. The route is confirmed, but what support will she and her sister aircraft require while they are away? It's been 74 years since D-Day, and there are not a lot of people alive today that actually remember it being there. You know, they, they were actually you know, part of D-Day. There are a lot of people that, that, that have heard stories, but as time passes, those memories fade. And what's cool about this project to me is that it's almost a rebirth in some ways of a D-Day veteran. So we're taking something that was old and forgotten and we're bringing it back to life and making it real again. Um, and we're taking it back to where, you know, it had its greatest challenge and its greatest, its greatest accomplishments. Going to Normandy in 2019 is kind of the ultimate goal of this whole project. To get there is pretty challenging. I mean, it's challenging operationally. We, got, we have to cross the Atlantic twice. Um, we're going to be operating a long way away from our support system for a long time. We're planning on being over there from anywhere from two to three months. Um, and then we've decided as, as an organization, the Commemorative Air Force has, that we're going to send three airplanes over. Um, so we're sending this airplane, obviously that's all brother is the lead airplane, and then two other airplanes that belong to the CAF, uh, D-Day Dahl and Blue Bonnet Bell are going to join us. So we've got to be prepared for any contingency. We obviously you know, don't want to get the airplane stuck overseas for any length of time. And so we want to make sure that we have a spares kit and that includes spare engines. And, you know, engines for this airplane are $70,000. Um, but, you know, we need to know that if we're over there and something happens to one of the engines that, you know, it's just labor to get it removed and replaced and get the airplane operational again. Um, the engine's the big spares item, but there's hundreds of other things that we have to make sure we have put together, tires, you know, um, all kinds of consumables, spare radios, those types of things. The trip across the Atlantic and back and, and operating in Europe, it is, you know, daunting. But at the same time, you know, airplanes like this flew across the Atlantic hundreds, of hundreds and thousands of times, you know, in, in 1944. And this airplane is, is as close to brand new as you can get a C-47 right now. So I, I don't think anybody's worried about, you know, the, the hazards of crossing, you know, the, but, but we do worry about the logistics and we want to make sure we're prepared and we don't have something happen that gets us stuck somewhere. Well, we, we are going to take the shortest possible route, but it's a lot of stops. And so the Great Circle Route, you know, we're going to leave out of here, travel to um, the Northeast Connecticut, and then go to Newfoundland, Greenland, Iceland, and then over to the UK with all those being stops. And, you know, we'll have to get fuel on the trip. You know, when you, when you fly, uh, American Airlines or British Airways, you know, over you're flying at 530 miles an hour, we'll be doing, if we're lucky, 130 miles an hour. So it's a, it's going to be a long trip. There's not going to be another 75th anniversary of D-Day, and frankly, unfortunately, there are not going to be a lot of opportunities to have living D-Day veterans uh, participate and, um, and be able to actually see this airplane back there. But I do think we can re rebirth their memories, so to speak. We can kind of reignite interest in what they did and the sacrifices they made and this airplane will just be a vehicle for us to do that. Oshkosh Air Show 2018. After great diligence and research, undertaken in particular by Matt Scales, the CAF have located many relatives of those who flew in that soul brother in wartime. To mark her official relaunch, the families have been invited not only to see the plane for the first time, but to participate in an emotional memorial flight. My dad was a piece of history and we didn't really even know about it until about three years ago when we found all his photographs and, and his medals. I mean, we knew he was in the war, and, uh, but he really didn't talk about it. And when we would ask questions, he would just say, well, I was in the war. Um, he just briefly would say, oh, I went on leave to England, I went to France, but other than that, he really didn't seem to want to talk about it. Officer was squadron navigator while overseas, flying in lead position in combat missions. Participated in the paratroop and glider drop invasions of Normandy, southern France, Wessel, Germany, and Holland has flown as navigator on flights using 
Dead Reckoning, Pilotage, Radio, Celestial, and Radar Navigation. One of the few things he said was, you know, basically, I was a navigator. And the story ended at that point. So, you know, being a kid, I says, okay, well, that's, <laughs> I guess that's what we did. But I mean, and he never went into it in much detail. He did a little, did a little more so with my sister, I think, in, the, in his latter years. But we, uh, strangely enough, we, we knew very little about his service. And it was not until my mother passed away that uh, my sister and I were looking through a lot of uh, the old uh, war memorabilia and what have you, and we started piecing together, you know, his involvement in the war. And we had, you know, photographs of him in the uh, regular airplane that he flew on, which was the Bell of Birmingham. And strangely enough, about two and a half years ago, uh, my company got hold of me and said, we've got an odd email that we received addressed to you and it's referencing it's some Air Force historian and um, it, it's referencing uh, somebody named John Shalcross so I said well send it on over we'll take a look at it and ends up that uh, gentleman who had tried to get hold of me God knows how he how he was able to do so his name was Matt Scales and he's an Air Force historian and he went on, you know, we'd been corresponding back and forth for some time, and he says, well, you know, your father was the navigator on the lead plane, that's all brother. And I said, no, I think you're mistaken. Uh, he, uh, he was on the Bell of Birmingham. And he says, well, yes, he was, but, and then went into the whole story about this. And at that point in time, it started making a little more sense what with all the photographs and looking through his war records and medals and stuff like that, it started, the picture started coming together a little more. You know, the, the World War II generation is, you know, largely gone now. And, you know, I guess we probably have maybe 10, 15 years at the most until the very last one uh, passes away. And so the airplane is, will, be, will be all that's left uh, to tell the story. And, and you take it a step further and those, those family members, there's many people that come to air shows like Oshkosh and they walk up to these B-25s or P-51s or whatever and they say, that's the kind of airplane your father flew or your grandfather flew or whoever. And very few people in this world can go to an airplane and say, that's the airplane that your actual relative flew or in this case, that's all brother jumped from. And those, and those individuals can and, and all of them, all of the crew members and paratroopers have long since passed away. Uh, the last one passed away in 2009 almost 10 years ago now and um, so for them to have a physical connection to their to their family member just means the world to me uh, I've gotten way too much credit way too much notoriety and all this whole process and, and it's it don't get me wrong it's fun and that's nice but truly honestly the the biggest thing for me is being able to connect those families Matt and I started working on this in 2007 and here it is 2018 and it's flying and we've been able to meet the wing that's flying it, being able to meet the ones who restored it, the CAF staff that helped with the fundraising, the families of the crew, the families of the uh, paratroopers who jumped. Uh, Matt has done most of the research on who the paratroopers were. There is no manifest, so we do not know the entire number that were on the plane. We don't know if it was 13, 14, or 15, somewhere in that area. So we've reached out to those that we do know and some of those descendants now know each other and they have gotten together and they actually came here to Oshkosh in, in 2018 and they were able to fly together as families on the, uh, I guess the maiden flight for it for the families and also uh, Matt and I, because of our roles in it, we were able to uh, go on that flight also. And it was very emotional for the families to know that it's the same plane that their ancestor either flew or was a crew member of or jumped out of on D-Day. And uh, it was pretty emotional for all of us. We're gonna be up for about 30 minutes. And what we're gonna do is once we're airborne and cruising at a level altitude, I'm going to give you a signal to disconnect your seatbelts. 
you can walk up to the uh, cabin or the cockpit. If you do that, would you just please? No, every, we've got 30, uh, 13 people to get through. Uh, get through that as fast as you can. Maybe we can do a second one. Anybody's going in the back, no more than two in the back at a time. And when you sit back down, please put the seat belts on in case we have a, a bump or something, okay? Now, when we get up there, we get everybody seat belted in, then I'll give you where the emergency exits are located, how to get out if, if we have an incident. We probably won't, but we want to make sure everybody understands where to get out, just like we do in the airlines. And we're going to have a good flight. I believe the Tom Travis is going to tell you how we're, and where we're going to go. I'm just going to turn him over to him. We're going to take off, go south, go right over the top of Oshkosh. And uh, so get your cameras ready. It's a magnificent shot site today. Lots of airplanes, lots of activity. And uh, so we'll go down south of Oshkosh, turn around and come back. We'll be about uh, 2,000 feet above the ground. So you should be able to get some good photos. We appreciate you flying with us again. And uh, welcome aboard. Scales and I started this in 2007 and of course we initially wanted to get the plane saved. That was the initial effort trying to find someone to save this plane and Commemorative Air Force are the only ones that stepped up. I would have never imagined in a million years that we'd ever be sitting in this airplane exactly like it was flying. At this point I don't think it's emotionally more it's almost just funny really. It's like I, I can't believe how could we I would have never imagined we'd ever get here, but here we are. Right on the other side of this wall would have been where my father was sitting. And uh, it's, it's just a neat feeling to be that close to him. military flying, my civilian flying, I've flown a lot of airplanes and a lot of a lot of time in the air and this is definitely the most special I've ever special flight I've ever been a part of, that's for sure. And again, all because of the family members. All goes back to them. A very smooth flight, a beautiful restoration job. Engines purred like kittens. It was incredible. They've done a fantastic job restoring this airplane. So well worthy of the uh, effort for eleven years now on this project. It was very emotional for me to be on the plane today and actually I actually sat down where he was sitting when when we were flying and it was very emotional for me. I broke down and just to know that he was sitting there so long ago in that exact spot was a phenomenal feeling. It was it was a culmination of something that uh, both my sister and I have been waiting to do for a while. Of course we uh, we joined or we donated to the cause uh, starting two and a half years ago and have been keeping up on the restoration of the aircraft ever since. And uh, we were, we, basically we were told uh, three and a half weeks ago, oh by the way, if you'd like to come out to Oshkosh, we got this big thing going on. And so we scrambled and uh, scrambled and got everything together because we wouldn't have missed it for the world. And uh, going up on the in the in the plane today, and being able to sit in my dad's navigation chair and just imagine what it would have been like for those guys was just fantastic. Following the success of the flight, and to round off the official relaunch, an event is held in the evening to which relatives, friends, and supporters are invited and celebrated. However, for the CAF it is a bittersweet moment. On behalf of the entire organization, I am so glad that you are here tonight. 
Now next is just a really special treat tonight to have the family members of the crew and the paratroopers for That's All Brother. They have special guests and ribbons as well. If you are a family member of a paratrooper or a crew member of TAB, please raise your hand. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to take just a moment to talk about a very serious situation that many of you have heard about. The mission to Normandy was planned to have three CAF aircraft make the historic journey across the Atlantic. As all of you know, Blue Bonnet Bell had an accident on takeoff Saturday morning. I'm sure you share my thankfulness that all of the occupants were able to exit the aircraft successfully. It is with great sadness to share that the Blue Bonnet Bell is destroyed. I will never forget even my own personal memories of crewing on the aircraft during the aftermath of Hurricane Harvey. The loss of the aircraft is no doubt heartbreaking and I've spoken with the crew and I'm happy to share that all are recovering from the accident. Mark Davis, the squadron leader, sends his regrets on not being able to join us tonight and that the Highland Lakes Squadron will not be able to participate in the mission to Normandy next year. The loss of this particular aircraft is a reminder to all of us of the dwindling numbers of these historic aircraft that we must honor and tell the stories of those who served in World War II. And this makes tonight all the more important. As if the loss of Blue Bonnet Bell were not enough of a setback for the CAF, there is soon further bad news. Potentially, given all that is at stake, worse news. The problem with the oil leak on That's All Brothers' left engine has escalated considerably after the extra hours of flying time and consequently the engine urgently needs attention. The plane is returned to Basler turbo conversions and the engine is removed. While the complex maintenance is carried out, that's all brother remains grounded and crippled in her hangar. The date with destiny in France in June 2019 cannot be changed, but now the fears grow that she won't make it at all. <laughs> <laughs> 